time I encounter my own book again, um, in the light of events of the last few weeks, it feels like entering a, a different landscape. And so, um, as much as you might be hearing these poems for the first time, I sometimes have the feeling that I am as well. So if I pause at any point, you will know why. It's like because something um, hits in a different way. I mean, it's a really extraordinary feeling, and I I'd never, obviously not anticipated um, what has happened. And because this was a book that was conceived very much with, with thinking about the way that history informs the present and how we don't learn lessons and how one displacement or one prejudice echoes another. Obviously, this has all kinds of ramifications as we move forward in history. Um, and my plans for what I'm going to read will probably change um, this evening, uh, this afternoon, as I go through the book. So, um, the first poem of the book is called Prologue. History becomes Cassandra. Done over, confused, she foretells the past and offers it to the future. As predicted, the project is doomed. The present believes her, but doesn't consider it. News. Anxious Jewish poem. When I wrote this poem, uh, it was a bit hypothetical, to be honest. I mean, I sort of felt it, but not really. And now suddenly it's, um, it's ringing for me in a different way. Anxious Jewish poem. Jewish Brits are quiet. Mostly hiding under hats and breathing lightly, eagerly inaudible in Jewish whispers, stretched and tuned to bashful British as Jewish deputies doff their, doff their kippot and stand to sing for king and country. It's been a Jewish while since records of a Jewish wave, and you might say we're safe. We pass for now, and some of us do not observe, do not observe at all, but Jewish who? would trust the territory, its Jewish folds and shifts, ancient slurs that blur on, cringe and bleed through skin of memory. Jewish history churns, red paint spits, the yids, the yids, fagans, shylocks, still the Jewish money gags, nose jobs, sentries at the gates. So keep your Jewish head down and your Jewish bag well packed. And when push comes to Jewish shove, as has been proved and proved again, my Jewish friends, however Jewish you are not, they won't forget your Jewish children and your Jewish God, your tarnished candlesticks, your stars, your rusty muzzle tops, your Jewish books. Never assume, accept your Jewish bread unleavened. Always be prepared to move. So this is a poem about my um, grandfather, who I never met, he was a doctor, but um, I often write poems at his desk, which I have happily inherited. Uh, and it's called Yankul, which is kind of Yiddish for Jack, and I was named after him, Jack and I never knew you, Jack. Or was it Yankel? But they named me after you. I heard you stank of shtetl, Jack. Your accent made them call you Jew. You never ditched your lit back twang, my mother said. Your brothers with the knack for shekels took you to the bank, bought you a desk, a white coat and a stethoscope, made you Dr. Jack. Oh, Grandpa Jack, you crazy Stalinist, caught on camera with the red flag, Edinburgh, May Day 1932, you leftist hack, the man whose eyes were sad and black. Who knows what you've been through? You left me clues. This, your scratched consulting desk, a streak of melancholy, 
tracks of dust and sepia. Your name. These words are all that I can give you back. Uh, and I, I guess one of the things that happened while I was researching this book was that I became aware of a huge um, amount of absence. So as much as I was researching my family history, there was no information. Even finding the name that my, uh, the village that my grandparents had come from was actually astonishingly difficult. Um, so that, that was part of the process of writing the book. Uh, but of course there were other things going on as well. Um, including Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And um, that, I wouldn't say um, unraveled the book, but it definitely caused a change in trajectory. Um, and um, I think some of the poems that are about that period of time are also about now. Um, they ring to be about now to me when I read them. So I, uh, I was away on a writing retreat shortly after Russia had invaded Ukraine. And um, I'm going to read this poem because somebody just came up to me and uh, told me how, how much she loved it. And so I thought I'd put it in. So if you're looking for a bit of light, you might find some here. There is some light and joy in the book, as well as um, a great deal of, of doubt, I suppose, and uh, recognition of what we're up against. So this is called The News and the Blackbird. I was sitting in a friend's uh, conservatory looking out at the garden, trying to write, and pretty much failing. The news and the blackbird. For days I've been nothing but important to myself. Writing this warring world, denying the distraction of blackbird outside my window. Blackbird who will not stop her song, who has no business here and cannot know my pain. And I don't know where my eyes have been except elsewhere and weeping. My mind twisting open like a fruit that won't release its stone. My heart grieving and beating in the orchards of war. But today the blackbird sang suddenly in the key of joy. Look out. Look up. And what else could I do but obey? as she folded into the green desire of plum tree, home to her nest that lay hidden, chick heavy and ravenous behind a celebration of leaves. set is not going as I planned at all, which is always a good thing, I think. Uh, so I, uh, one of the things that happens, I think, when you're, a, you know, probably particularly to someone who's an atheist, secular Jew like me, but culturally identified, um, is that there are kind of, a, there are sort of two voices, and you'll hear those in the poem. One is much longer than the other. There are long sections and short sections, but there are the bits that are telling you to keep quiet and not to say certain things. Jew. A word that wriggles on the tongue. Honey beast and almond, the soup of the afflicted, the wanderer, the tailor, the usurer, the book, the beard, the flat cap communist, capital conspiracy, the ducat and the lamb, the Red Sea parting, slaughter and the slaughterer, the ones who pass, the ones who don't, the nose, the noses. No, don't speak those. The ten plagues, keeper of the word, the shovers hats, the shtetl and the noise, the silence and the Sunday luncheon tongue, the chicken head, the chicken feet, the yellow chicken fat, the yellow star. No, step away, not them, not that. The interloper, interleaver, interbreeder, sadist bomber, the broken glass, the kosher red, the red, the dross, the shekels and the silver and the arcane script, the pointer, the art of secular, the swastika. But why go there? Don't go there. The dispossessed, the voyagers, the drowned, the candles and the soup of dread, the dread of soup, the trains, the dead. Don't dwell on that. The chutzpah, chuppah, the marriage and the get, the herd, the minion and the chosen. 
No, don't use that word. The shutters colour and the oven deep soup of despair. No, there's too much inference in there. The Nobel and the intellect, the where, where, not here, diaspora, the kletzma, muzzletov, the Shabbos bride, the candlestick, the Yiddishkeit, the pogrom. No, no, too grim, too grim. The tribe, what tribe, whose tribe am I, the exodus, the Shabbos guy, the scheitel maker and the synagogue, the bagelmeister, locks, messiah, grave digger, the mark upon the door, the vengeful god, the smoking tower and the big black boot. What did I tell you? Leave that one out. The blinzer, herring and gefilter fish, the just god, no damn god, the circumcision and the guilty god, the innocent, the pelt, the golden calf, blood sacrifice, the millionth Haggadah, the freedom and the desert blooming, the grind, the no goodnik heart, the loss, the loss and the broken homeland, kissed and coveted and lost, the uniform, the gun, the camps, the mortar and the gun, the firing squad. No, no, move on, move on. Diaspora, diaspora, the song, the song of sanctuary, forgotten song, the broken tongue. What song? What song? So um, in the uh, Jewish calendar, Yom Kippur um, is the Day of Atonement, or as my husband calls it, the, um, the Annual Performance Review for Jews. Um, it's the day when you take stock, and you know, I'm not a religious Jew, but I really like this idea of thinking about the past year and thinking about who I need to forgive and what I need to forgive myself for. Um, so this is called Yom Kippur. By afternoon, I am hallucinating. Oh, oh, I should say as well that you fast on Yom Kippur. You know, the Muslims fast during Ramadan for 40 days, isn't it? Um, every day. The Jews fast for one day and make a really, really big fuss about it. <laughs> <laughs> Yom Kippur. By afternoon, I am hallucinating salted caramel. Which is good for poetry because Nobody wants implacably sweet in this age of irony. And now they tell us salt won't clog our hearts after all, so maybe it's okay that today, as the godless cycle in secular joy around the car-free streets of Jerusalem and hungry Jews everywhere grow increasingly bad-tempered, I still hold these grudges, lovely, stodgy lumps at the bottom of my empty atheist stomach, Although I no longer remember why and cannot therefore advise my son to prostrate himself before Justin Bieber for insulting him repeatedly on Twitter. Or my daughter to sweetly forgive those girls for guessing her password and reading her text messages, especially considering my own sins are so old and wide and manifold. And even as the salt is drying on my lashes, I cannot bring myself to say sorry to my own dead mother, whom I should have venerated but once told to fuck off out of my life, or to a lost friend who even now I dare not name, upon whom I may or may not have once inflicted terrible wrongs I cannot even now recall, or to the children drowned near the shore to whom I give scant portions of my mourning in momentary horror, or for the promises I may or may not have made to polar bears and nameless multitudes, and I must atone for the sins of my people, whoever my people are, even though I must atone, God damn it, as if it makes a difference for my trespasses, omissions, misdemeanors, I must return to the home of my soul, wherever that is. The home I cannot find, however hard I pray. <coughs> I, I didn't look at my watch when I started, it seems like. How long have I got? Anyone know? Yeah. Okay, so, uh, I feel like you deserve a something a little bit more cheerful. So, so um, this poem is called Muzzle, and it's not as in like a muzzle on a dog. It's muzzle, which is a Yiddish word meaning luck, um, luck of the very best kind. Muzzle. 
We seize it, like ice cream in summer, like love when you're lonely, like kiss me again, like sex, like time, like home, like taking the corners of this wide life over and over while we still can. The blinds rise to muzzle as they let in the light. The summer shines it in sky shades of forget-me-not. A sun brews it in the blessing of morning coffee. A daughter carries muzzle home, baked into hot bread from the flowery queue at the dusty knuckle. A woman at the beach car park offers muzzle, winding down the window of her Ford Fiesta with the gift of a free dashboard ticket to a beautiful day going nowhere. And on towel-striped sands, a stranger tosses cones of muzzle from a box of melting cornettos because no way can I eat them all myself. And talking of self, and melt. A person can be muzzled too, like you are now, chancing in with your smile on show as I write this poem. The way your cheeks round like small pink plums, your head tilts a little, little to the left like always, your eyes say mensch, mensch. Sand and years, kiss me again, forget me never, and muzzle, muzzle, muzzle tough. Another day, rounding another corner. Um, so just two more poems. I'm going to read one more from here, and then I'm going to read the new one. Um, I did write a hundred sonnets. I wrote one every day during the first lockdown, and I didn't think I would ever write a sonnet again. But amazingly, just very recently, I did. I've written three poems since I finished the manuscript for this book. And this is one of those, but maybe this the one I'm going to read first is from the book. So this is called uh, Peace Be Upon You. And um, it, uh, what do I need to tell you about it? I need to tell you a few things. Uh, one is that um, Chagall painted the painting on the front of this book, which is the um, one of his fiddlers on the roof. Um, and one of his fiddlers on the roof inspired the um, musical Fiddler on the Roof. And um, the musical Fiddler on the Roof was inspired by the short stories of an amazing writer of the early 20th century who wrote uh, plays and, and poetry, um, Shola Melehe. And he wrote these stories about Tevier, the dairyman that found their way into a uh, Fiddler on the Roof. Now, there are a lot of violins in this book. Peace be upon you, and a little quote from Tevier, Fiddler on the Roof. Every one of us is a fiddler on the roof trying to scratch out a pleasant, simple tune without breaking his neck. Mandatory like mothers or doctors or herring, there were violin lessons, classical and klezmer dredged from the mass graves of Europe in rituals of horsehair and resin. The old stories disinterred from forests, rising from velvet, catgut. Rosewood. What Jewish parent would not stick Chagall's violinist vair to the door of a refrigerator, or would not quell to say, my kid, the fiddle player, or would not speak in tones of awe of Heifetz, Oystra, Memory? It is no easy task to coax a soul from the instrument. I won't say I was good. But once or twice I felt history's river bless my hands as I drew the bow across the strings and entered the dreamscape of Sholem Alechem, he who kept alive the shtetl of the mind. Play on, he told me. Don't forget. Sometimes there was a hat, often a homecoming, a wedding, a pogrom, a farewell. And now and then a crazy musician balanced on a rooftop above a village nobody remembers playing the violin. Now let's see, I've never done this before, this poem on the phone thing, but oh look, it's, it's here. So, um, uh, yeah, I, don't, I think this poem pretty much speaks for itself. It is a sonnet, so it's quite short. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure um, to be sharing the stage with, with two such wonderful artists. Thank you so much. Meeting the enemy. Meeting the enemy. At the moment, that's what it's called. And talking of love, guess what I don't love? 
flags, those crashed allies of destruction, your darlings wielded like Kalashnikovs, their colours raised aloft as nations burn, burst their seams and unstitch their souls. So many words for blood, for blame, for loss, for bombs and borderlines, the stranglehold of rage could take us all, the human curse. But why not talk of love? Where shall I start? I love an open hand, poets at their pens, big men embracing, breaking bread, the art of building bridges. Friend, may I call you friend? I could love even you and all the breathing trees, a quiet sky with nothing falling but the leaves.